Somebody asked Ernest Hemingway, how do you write a novel? And he said, you first clean the refrigerator. <laughs> well, I clean many refrigerators. Probably you do too. No novel came out of that. <laughs> Instead, I found myself uh, traveling around the globe from Tel Aviv to Moscow, Beijing, Paris, Africa, back to Jerusalem, New York, and found the stories right within myself, right inside. Back when I was 16 years old, a student at uh, Alliance Francaise, a French high school in Tel Aviv, I was sent by my high school to Paris for the first time. And I walked the streets of Montmartre, and all of a sudden, I knew with unshaken knowledge that my grandmother should have lived there. She should never have married, she should never have had children. I would not be speaking to you today. Instead, she should have become an artist during the avant-garde era and have achieved international acclaim as an artist. I discovered that there was actually no information. This central place in history and geography, Jerusalem, did not have documentation about the women, especially the Ashkenazi women I was looking at. And I found it quite astounding. I interviewed old women about their mother's lives. I spoke with historians. And I uh, walked the streets of Jerusalem with a rare map, 1912 map. I walked in a cemetery to look into s stones. But mostly, I looked into newspapers and read the rabbi's decrees against women. And from those rabbis' decrees, I learned so much with my modern sensibility of what it feels like to be a young woman in Jerusalem at the time. I also discovered that the women in Jerusalem, Ashkenazi women particularly, but Sephardic as well, were kept illiterate. They were not educated, while men studied the yeshiva from the age of three. They studied from dawn to dusk for the rest of their lives, not so women. In fact, I discovered that what is very typical to women in societies that where the societies married off girls at a young age was that you keep them illiterate, you keep them obedient, and you keep them loyal to whatever the mission. And the mission that was put on the shoulders of these young women was very simple hasten the Messiah's arrival. That's simple, right? You can do that by getting married and procreating, giving birth to a lot of children. The fact was that maternity death was 50% for these young women, and so was child, maternity, uh, child mortality. 50% of all children did not live to the age of five. The Ottoman Empire ruled from 1517 to 1917, for 400 years. At the early part, they brought some modernity relevant to 400 years before. But towards the end, as it was crumbling, it still they had not paved the streets of Jerusalem since biblical times. There was no running water, no sanitation, no electricity. For comparison, let's think about the Zionist women of the time. In, into the Holy Land in the, early, in the late 1800s, early 1900s, students from Europe, Jewish students from Europe began to arrive, men and women. They, they looked, the women looked for equality with men, looked for political power. They uh, dried swamps, they helped pave roads, they sought political equality with men, one of them we all heard about, Golda Meir. So there's a huge difference between the Jewish women, the Zionist women of the Holy Land, and this group of women, the Ashkenazi women, who were hiding in, that, uh, in the Jerusalem courtyard. Some people ask me about the conditions that are described in my book. 
how, how amazing they were. Well, I could not put all of this information, including, for example, the case of the cake being broken on, on a girl's head, because sometimes fiction has to be believable. <laughs> <laughs> and not all facts are believable in fiction. So I had to temper down some of the information I was discovering.